So uh, for the next few minutes, I will cover the, uh, the livestock provisions in the Farm Bill. There are, there are actually several different provisions scattered all throughout the Farm Bill. Really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna touch on probably the main three and then just a few of the miscellaneous items after that and then Tommy will come up and talk some about the dairy. Give you just a short background on what we're gonna talk about, <clears throat> uh, some of the background on the, uh, the livestock provisions. Then we're gonna talk about the forage disaster program, the indemnity program, uh, the ELAP program, which is the emergency kind of a catch-all. And then like I said, I'll mention uh, a few other things. Uh, so let's talk first uh, just for a few minutes about the background. <clears throat> And as you can tell, a lot of this is based in drought, uh, or the, the unavailability, if you will, of, of different forages, which I realize that's kind of hard for us to think about a drought right now, given the winter and in the situation that we're in right now. But basically, as we talk about uh, the, far, the, uh, the background, just remember that we had in the 08 Farm Bill, we had some provisions in there for several of these programs, like the Forage Disaster Program, which many of you are familiar with, that's the old feed cost assistance program uh, that some of you have either participated in or you've had people participate in. The indemnity program as well as this, the ELAP program. Well, what happened was because uh, of the, I guess, the, the political situation that we were dealing with, those, those uh, programs actually lapsed at the end of September of 2011. And so what the 2014 Farm Bill does is go back retroactively well, it does two things. First of all, it makes these programs permanent. The other thing that it does is it goes back retroactively to October the 1st of 2011 and tries to get producers caught up. Uh, a couple of the main things, uh, one of the main things to remember is that all three of these programs that I will show you here are administered through the FSA office. So if you want to sign up for these, you'll need to go to your local FSA office to sign up. For most of these, as I, as I uh, mentioned, they were uh, refunded these programs, so they put money there, went back to October the 1st of 11. Uh, sign up is gonna be in the bill that says on or before April the 15th of this year. The reality is it will be April the 15th uh, because the, the FSA people that I talked to in charge of these programs, they haven't even had their national training yet. They're gonna go next week, I think, for their national training. Then their state training will be the first week of April. So it's gonna be April the 15th before we know anything here in Georgia. Uh, again, you're gonna make those, uh, <clears throat> those claims at your local FSA office. One thing to keep in mind though is the total amount uh, for these programs for one given year is gonna be $125,000 per entity. Now, the, that's ex excluding some partnerships and some other things, but really we're talking about $125,000 payment limitation for these programs in a given year. All right, so the first thing that we'll talk about is gonna be the Forage Disaster Program. How many of you all are somewhat familiar with the Forage Disaster Program or the Feed Assistance Program? Okay, well, there's really nothing new here. Uh, the main thing is, is now it's permanent retroactive back to October the 1st this year. Um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, is for people that have suffered grazing losses due to either drought or fire. The fire here is mostly for people that are grazing on, on federally managed lands, which I don't know that we have any of that here in the state. But if, uh, if you or somebody that you know are uh, ranching way out west and you've got some public lands in Idaho, Wyoming, some of those types of places, then you would be eligible for this if there was a fire on those lands. You're gonna get 60% of the monthly feed cost up to five months. Um, and the way that they're calculating the monthly feed cost is 15.7 pounds of corn per cow per day. So if we're talking about different classes of livestock, it's gonna be relative to that cow. So in some instances, let's say that we're talking about steers or stalkers, maybe they're saying that two stalkers equals one cow or something like that. So, I mean, those rules will be set by FSA, uh, but then in general, if we're, talk, if we're using a beef cow as, as your base animal, then we're talking about 15.7 pounds per cow per day, and the price is gonna be based off of a national uh, corn sales price for that year. And there's a couple of different ways that they can calculate it, and the law stipulates that they will go with the higher of the two. So we're going with the higher price there, those two. Uh, the animals that are, are eligible are beef cattle, dairy cattle, sheep, I've got in parentheses goats, 
uh, goats were not specifically listed in this particular bill. They were in the 08 Farm Bill, so there's a decision there that has to be made as to whether uh, goats will be included also. Uh, and then uh, we've got equine for commercial purposes. So that is generically specific, if you will, in terms of what is a commercial purpose uh, for equine. Obviously, that, that may not include pleasure animals, but if you're in a situation where you're using those animals uh, either to work cattle in the daily operations of the business, or if you're offering a stud service, you've got a boarding facility or something like that, and you're relying on grazing, uh, then uh, those are commercial purposes. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'll show you a few pictures in just a couple of minutes. But one of the main things is the county eligibility is now determined by the drought monitor. And we'll go through that in just a second. <clears throat> the main thing to keep in mind, most of y'all are familiar with the levels of drought. You know, we go uh, zero through five, which D zero is, is no drought, uh, and five is the absolute worst. <clears throat> if your county is in D two for eight plus consecutive weeks, and you'll get one, then you'll be eligible for one monthly payment. If your county is in D three, if it goes to D3 for any time, then you're going to get three monthly payments. <clears throat> and keep in mind that when we're talking about the drought monitor, you can't go from D0 to D3 in a week. So it's a cumulative thing. You know, you'll go from D0 to D1 to D2, and then eventually it's a progressive uh, system. So that's the reason that it's constructed this way. Uh, if you're in D3, uh, D3 for four plus weeks, we're talking about four monthly payments. And then finally that D4 there will get you up to the five monthly payment uh, maximum. All right, I've got a couple of old pictures in here, so these are not current, but just to give you an idea, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's been a while since we've had uh, this situation down here in the southeast, but you know pretty well on a drought monitor that any color is not a good thing in terms of drought. Uh, and the darker the red, the worse it is. So you can see this is what we were dealing with a couple of years ago when basically the southern half of the state was in a severe drought. You can see over here on the left, <clears throat> zero is abnormally dry. Um, the, the brown one, which is the D2, over here is a severe drought, extreme drought, and exceptional drought. So that's what it looks like on a national basis. Y'all remember about five or six years ago, thankfully, or hopefully most of us have forgotten this now, but you know, we were dealing with this quite some time ago and this the reason I've got this is this just shows the different, this is, uh, shows the different classifications across the state in terms of what it would look like. So over here in the western part of the state would be D4, uh, this red part over here would be D3, and the yellow would be, uh, or the brown would be D2. The yellow part, which is D1 or D0, wouldn't be eligible, but these others would be eligible for those different payments like I showed you. One of the things uh, that is worth knowing <clears throat> is going back to October the 1st of, of uh, 2011, which is actually the, the uh, fiscal year 2012. Basically all of the states, but not quite all the state, uh, I'm sorry, all the counties. So not quite all the counties in the state of Georgia will be eligible for some level of payment based on this information. So as soon as we get the regulations written, <clears throat> and they're published, it probably is worth you going into your local FSA office and, and trying to sign up because as you can see, there's a lot of the state that actually will be eligible uh, for some type of payment based on what happened 2011 and forward. A couple of key points, uh, one of the big things is, <clears throat> is that the NAP or the risk management requirement is no longer a requirement under the new bill. So you know before you had to have some form of insurance uh, before you were eligible for this disaster program. That is not the case now. So that is not a requirement. <clears throat> you will need to be able to document the number of animals that were affected. So you can do that either with, uh, if you just some type of record, whether it's herd health records, uh, whether it's a balance sheet or something that you've prepared for a bank, you know, some type of documentation where you can show the number of animals that you had during that period. One of the other things that you'll need <clears throat> is you're gonna need either a written lease or some type of signed affidavit by the landowner if you're renting land. Okay, so if you're renting pasture land, you're gonna to have to have some type of written affidavit by the landowner saying that Billy Joe Bob Henry was renting so many acres of pasture land from me. And the reason for that is, is apparently there's been some situations 
to where you had a, a crop farmer that had a, an entire farm rented and he was subleasing the pasture land out to someone else, but yet maybe he was claiming those open acres for other purposes, you know, whether that be for his crop reporting purposes or something else. So this is the reason that you've got it now. If you're renting pasture land, you're gonna to have to have a signed lease or something from the landowner saying, this person had all the, the, had so many acres rented from me for grazing purposes. You'll need to have all that information before you go into the FSA office. Otherwise, it's gonna take you a couple of trips. So just be prepared for that. Okay, uh, the Livestock Indemnity Program, <clears throat> also known as LIP. You know, we've got all kinds of acronyms here. Uh, again, this goes back to, to uh, fiscal year 2012. Basically, in Georgia, what that's gonna cover uh, is going to be death by several different uh, adverse weather problems here such as hurricanes, floods, blizzards, uh, disease, wildfires, extreme heat and cold that typically will not get you qualified here in Georgia. Um, <clears throat> but it would qualify say in some of the places like Wyoming and, and Dakotas where they had the blizzards. Um, you'll get paid at 75 percent of the value of the animal the day before it died. So one of the things that's uh, if you're not aware of this even if you have animals that are already insured uh, with Farm Bureau insurance or someone else, um, you can actually collect on this program twice. So you can turn, matter of fact, if you submit a, a claim to Farm Bureau, and, and especially in the, in the case of a lightning strike, flood, something like that, if you turn that in, then you can take that documentation to the FSA office and they'll pay you too. So I've actually had the, the, uh, the federal people tell me, yes, you can actually double dip on this. So this program, uh, it is tied to a specific event. In Georgia, most of the things are gonna be things like I, said, like I mentioned, lightning, uh, with some of the tornadoes and the high winds that we've, come, that, that we've experienced that'll come through and blow down a poultry house or something like that. The, the birds are indemnified. You know, all of these are different types of situations to where you can get paid. Uh, my guess is, is that this winter, <coughs> that we've had will not, won't qualify because this is not really a function of heat or cold, it's just sorry hay and people uh, not exercising proper management in many instances. So that won't get you paid, but something like a lightning strike, a blizzard, something like that uh, will, will qualify. These are the animals that are, are eligible and you can see it's basically everything that we talked about. <clears throat> One of the main things that you probably should do and be aware of is if you think you have a claim, you need to contact your local FSA office immediately. Matter of fact, if, if uh, it's a lightning strike and you've still got the animals laying under the tree, you just need to leave them there, take a picture, call FSA, and let them tell you what to do, okay? Uh, take a picture, video them, do something. I mean, every, pretty well everybody's got some type of phone right now, so if nothing else, uh, video that or get your grandkid or your kid to come out there and show you how to do it. <coughs> All right, the last thing is the emergency assistance program for livestock, uh, honeybees, and some of these other farm-raised fish. Basically, this is a catch-all uh, disaster program for things that don't qualify under the forage disaster program or the indemnity program. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's now permanent. There's not a risk management requirement, just like I mentioned with the forage disaster program. Uh, there actually is a funding limit here of $20 million per year. Some examples. Uh, that, uh, that we'll see, especially here in Georgia, there might be some instances where there's been a loss due to a colony, that colony collapse disorder. So some of those, uh, some of those instances might be funded. If you're in a situation where there's been a flood and you haven't lost the animals, uh, but you did, in, you did incur some additional feeding costs, then in, in some of those instances that might qualify uh, under this program. Um, there's also been some instances maybe if there's a plague of grasshoppers or locusts or something move through, uh, then those are eligible as well. All right, so just a couple of things uh, that I'll mention, <coughs> just, uh, just uh, for your information, there's now a voluntary, uh, I'm gonna call it trichinosis uh, certification program. Uh, there's now a sheep production and, and uh, marketing program, which is basically uh, designed to, uh, to help expand or bolster uh, the sheep industry here in the United States. Um, <coughs> As it relates to uh, MCOOL, or Mandatory Country of Origin Labeling, uh, the law did direct that there would be an economic analysis um, conducted 
and venison was added to the list of products. So I didn't know that the United States was a huge importer of venison, especially here in Georgia. I'm, uh, you know, if we could ever get a market for that, I think we could probably fix our problems. But venison has been added to the list of products that are required uh, on mandatory country of origin labeling. Uh, we now have a National Animal Health Laboratory Network. Uh, catfish remain under the inspection of the, uh, of the agricultural services of USDA as opposed to FDA. If you're not familiar with it, typically fish and seafood are inspected by FDA, not USDA, but uh, catfish remain under the inspection of, uh, of uh, USDA. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> the, the actually one of the last uh, sentences or sections in the Farm Bill is for a feral swine eradication program. Somebody was asking me what this means, and as, as I read it, all it said was Congress understands that that's a problem now. So uh, that was about where they left it, other than the fact that we recognize that it's a threat to the domestic swine industry. They didn't mention anything about peanuts or corn, but uh, it's, a, it's a threat there as well. Uh, and they also directed the uh, State Departments of Agriculture to make eradication a high priority. So there was no money, no. It just said it's important y'all think about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if it's gonna matter, you gotta put the money there, right? But So uh, that's where we are in terms of those provisions. I guess I'll summarize by saying the LFP, the LIP, uh, and that emergency assistance program, those are the big three that I think really are most applicable to most of our folks here in Georgia. They are retroactive back to October the 1st, 2011. Sign up's gonna be on or about April the 15th, so be paying close attention to that, and all of these are gonna be administered through FSA.